test. Do we have quorum? I think that we're there. I'll wait for everybody to get logged in because I think that um, we do have printed copies. Madam Chair, the time is 4.02. You have quorum. Welcome. I will call to order the April 18th, 2022 Oklahoma City Arts Commission meeting. Um, can we have a roll call on attendance? Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner Bailey. Present. Commissioner Kovash. Present. Commissioner Salyer. Commissioner Booker. Commissioner Chambers. Present. Commissioner Cooper. Present. Commissioner Duong. Commissioner Eichmann. Present and I can't log in. Okay. Commissioner Hill. Commissioner Hill. Commissioner Loftus. Here. Commissioner Mosant. Here. Commissioner Ramirez. Commissioner Ramirez. Commissioner Seward. Here. Commissioner Smalling. Commissioner Smalling. 
Commissioner Williams. Commissioner Williams. That completes the roll call. Madam Chair, you have quorum. Thank you, and welcome members of the public. If you will be um, speaking on any items today on the agenda, when you approach the podium, we will ask for your name and address and in reference to the item. And it, please raise your hand if we're on the item and I call for members of the public to speak. Our first item on the agenda is item two, accepting of the meeting minutes from the February 21st, 2022 regularly scheduled meeting. So moved. Second. I have a motion from Commissioner Kovash and a second from Commissioner Cooper. Any further discussion? Hearing none, can we have a roll call vote? Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner Bailey? Yes. Commissioner Kovash? Yes. Commissioner Chambers? Yes. Commissioner Cooper? Yes. Commissioner Eichmann? Yes. Commissioner Loftus? Yes. Commissioner Mossant? Yes. Commissioner Seward? Yes. That completes the roll call vote, Madam Chair. The motion passes. Thank you. Item 3A, a currently untitled lighted sculpture by Tracy and Rick Bewley of Art Fusion for the Civic Center Music Hall at 210 North Walker Avenue in Ward 6. Randy, can you present this item? Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Bailey. Um, I'm Randy Marks, Public Art Project Manager. Thank you all for being here today. And uh, the first item on the uh, agenda that we're going to discuss is, a, is the sculpture, or actually two sculptures, for the Civic Center Music Hall. And let's see. Okay. Mark, I'm having trouble with this advancing. It's still not. We'll get this worked out in just a moment. You may be noticing a new face here, um, so I'm going to leave you in suspense until it gets down to staff report, so make sure that all of you stick around for that. Anyway, um, we recently concluded the selection for Public Art for Civic Center Music Hall, which as you know is undergoing a major reno renovation, and you've probably seen the new addition that's being added to the north side. There's also a renovation going on in the lobby, and the 1% for Art project is, is in fact going into the lobby. Go ahead and advance the slide if you would. Uh, this is the, the uh, work that was proposed by uh, Rick and Tracy Bewley of Art Fusion Studio and selected by the selection committee and recommended to you uh, for your consideration. This is an uh, Art Deco piece that is designed in the um, Art Modern style, which is more typical of the type of Art Deco that uh, you may be familiar with the famous posters of ships, planes, automobiles, and all that, emphasizing uh, mass and motion. And that was the inspiration for Rick and Tracy on this particular piece. The dimensions of each identical sculpture, there'll be two of them that'll be placed in, in the lobby, and they're lighted sculptures. The dimensions are 116 inches by 84 inches by 72 inches tall. So these are substantial pieces and they will be fabricated from brushed stainless steel, brushed anodized aluminum, which will be a brass color, 
and white glass, and some of which will have a dichroic finish. And I kind of think that Rick Bewley may stand up here in a minute and say something about this, and he can explain a little bit more about dichroic glass. But anyway, it causes, the finish causes the uh, surface color of the light, of the glass to change depending on if light is being reflected from it, where you're standing in relation to it, or if light is coming through the glass. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide if you would. Just a schematic of the piece, and you can see the dimensions there. And then the next slide. Of course, that's the Civic Center, which we all know and love. And um, to the right, the lobby as it currently is, and circled up there are two of the five fixtures. Uh, all five of those fixtures are going to be removed in the renovation. But the new works will go in those two places where you see the ovals. So be really dramatic. Uh, as uh, one of our uh, selection committee members said, it's the show before the show. You walk in, you see these, and it puts you in, in the mode to go in and see whatever it is you're going to see at the Civic Center. Now, in the lower left-hand corner is the architect's rendering of what that space is going to look like. And you see the two blue banquettes, which are movable but they'll be there most of the time, and the, uh, the light fixtures, the hanging lighted sculptures will be positioned directly above those. Uh, you see a fixture there in the middle, that's not gonna be there. But also notice that the lobby is opened up, and so the emphasis gets pushed on from the lobby into the inner lobby where there's going to be new bar and other new amenities back in there. So that is the overall um, picture of what is uh, planned for the Civic Center, and um, I'll be happy to take any questions. Commissioners, Commissioner Cooper. Um, are these, the, these, these are uh, functional light fixtures also? Yes, they are. Uh, they're, they're, not in, they're not intended necessarily to light up the entire space. There will be other lighting, uh, but they, they will be lighted. Well, it looked like that there were light bulbs in it, but I wasn't sure if that was just a shape or if that was a, a light bulb that was showing in one of the drawings. What you're seeing are actually shapes of uh, kiln form glass that okay. will be included as part of the fixture. So you don't now, actually... Is the bulb going to be above that? We'll let, we'll let uh, Rick answer that in more detail if that's okay with you. That, that, that would be fine. And okay. also I was wondering, as you're looking in this picture that shows the inner and outer lobby, uh, you, the uh, picture that shows the outer lobby shows the two fixtures, but when you look through into the inner lobby, it looks like there's another fixture in there. Is, is there another fixture in that or is that just the artist rendering in this it's an artist rendering, and I think what you're looking at is the design that goes above the bar. So that's part of the brand new bar uh, structure and in installation that will be in that area. Oh, okay. It just looked like it had lights on it too, so I was wondering. It was we think part there of the will be lights scheme. on it. They will not be part of the 1% for art program, though. Any other questions from commissioners? Yes, Commissioner Loftus. How many fixtures are there going to be? There will be two of them. And the, the total price on this is $184,000. And you might remember that $100,000 was donated by the Civic Center Foundation to augment the 1% for art the funds. LED. Yes. Thank you. I'm right about that. Yeah. Commissioner, okay. uh, Commissioner Kovash. Are the other, the lights that aren't circled in red, are those going away? Yes, all, actually all five of those are going away. Right, understood that The part. two that are where the ovals are, that's the those are the locations where these two will go. So there are some uh, plaster details up on the ceiling, you know, sh these shapes that define some areas, and there is currently is a light fixture in each one of those uh, shapes. Do you know where the, uh, you said that the, the lights of Buleys are going to be making are not going to be the primary source of light. Where, where are those going to come? Where's that light going to come from? I'm not exactly sure, but the architect's working on that. My understanding is that there'll be something like uh, recess, some recessed lighting that will help illuminate the entire area. Without now, taking these are away. Gonna, without these taking are going to provide away. some substantial amount of light, but they're yeah. just not in, in, in vision to light up the entire room. Okay, thank you. I believe the artist is here to speak yes. on this item. Yeah. Feel free. 
Can I have your <coughs> name and address for the record? Rick Uly, 1218 Northwestern. <laughs> Thank you. Feel free to talk about the piece, and if there are any questions, I'll open the floor for questions after you've spoken. So yeah, if I could clarify a little bit about the lighting, there seem to be some questions about that. So it's designed primarily, when it's over these two banquettes, they talked about those being movable, and if there's an event in there, there's gonna be tables there probably. So we wanted to be sure and have down lighting at that spot. As described to us on the site visit, there's just can lights, everywhere that are the primary lighting for it. They weren't particularly interested in them being dimmable, but they are LEDs that will be dimmable, you know, based on a completely new design and no way to mock up how it's gonna look. We wanted to be sure and have adjustable lights so that dim or not, it, it was the perfect lighting. Um, so all the glass that shines down is white and then the dichroic glass, the, the reason we're so uh, set on that, you know, what we know about Art Deco and the, the time period and using the latest, coolest, greatest materials, we're sure if dichroic glass would have been available at the time that they would have, they would have used it. Um, they used the iridized Tiffany's glass at the time. And basically, dichroic glass, if you've seen it before, it's usually a little piece of jewelry that's real colorful and sparkly. Um, <clears throat> We like to use it as a reflective source. When you shine a light on it, the surface that reflects off of it is opposite of the color that shines through it. So when these lights are on, it's gonna be a pale blue. And when the lights are off, it's gonna be reflective gold. So that was the reasoning behind that. Any questions? Yes, Commissioner Chambers. Hi, Rick. You said in your artist statement that for you and Tracy, this is the highlight of your career? So, yeah, I mean, we've both just been huge Art Deco fans. A few of us that know us know that we used to live in Art Modern House, um, you know, and we, we both grew up going to the Civic Center. Of course, Tracy talking about the symphony with her parents and me talking about seeing meatloaf there, which she had to be <laughs> sure and put musician for the uh, jurors that weren't old enough to know who meatloaf was. but. Uh, and again, it's, it's, if you know our art style, it's heavily influenced by Art Deco. Lots of geometric shapes and forms. And you know, when we read the proposal, it was one of those, when you read it, it was like, this was written for us. Um, we, you know, we, we can't not apply for this. So yeah, Tracy's still jumping up and down. That's great. Well, seeing no further questions from the commission, um, I would open the floor for a motion. So moved. Second. Commissioner Seward with a motion and a second from Commissioner Cooper. Any further discussion? So were there any uh, requirements? Yeah, were there any, uh, this is a 1% project, so did we have any outstanding requirements that needed to be included in a motion on this uh, item? Vera, uh, and the public. Yeah, Vera, Vera waiver. Uh, we'll, we'll do all the standard procedures, okay. so there will be VERA waivers, everything that is normally required is it uh, for the 1%. Uh, and they'll, they'll provide engineering and all of that will be vetted. Commissioner Kovash? Is it appropriate to do a sign? Oh yeah, marker. definitely, and, a, art and an art ident always uh, an art identification marker. And uh, Rick and Tracy bring this to their projects. Also they design, fabricate, and install unique art identification markers. I think that we're gonna see that here too, correct? Yes, You're, yes, all of those things will be included uh, when they receive a notice to proceed. Thank you. Can we have a roll call vote on this item? Thank, Thank you. you, Madam Chair, Commissioner Bailey. Yes. Commissioner Kovash. Yes. Commissioner Chambers. Yes. Commissioner Cooper. Yes. Commissioner Eichmann. Yes. Commissioner Loftus? Yes. Commissioner Mossant? Yes. Commissioner Seward? Yes. That completes the vote, Madam Chair. The motion passes. Thank you. May I say something? Yes, Commissioner Cooper. Uh, I don't know the Buleys, but I'm very familiar with their names. I've seen their work over the years, many places. I think this just looks gorgeous. Thank you, Commissioner. Noted. 
Noted. <laughs> Item 3B, Dave's in the Prairie, a mural by Splatterhouse for Dave's Hot Chicken at 208 Johnny Bench Drive in Ward 7. Randy, can you present this item for us? Yes. Thank you, Rick. Go ahead and advance to the next one, if you would. So uh, Dave's in the Prairie is the title of a mural proposed for the upcoming Dave's Hot Chicken in Lower Bricktown. Uh, you see an elevation drawing of the structure here. And then the mural, uh, which it can, is composed of uh, basically three different units on, the, on two sides of the building uh, with variable dimensions. Uh, the work is designed and will be painted by Splatterhouse, which is an artist collective in LA. And they've worked with some of the other Dave's in the, uh, Dave's Hot Chickens around the country. They don't do all of them, but they, done, they have done some, and the local owners wanted to work with them for this particular pro, uh, project. Uh, go ahead and advance to the next slide. This is the uh, site plan uh, in Lower Bricktown. So this is generally in the vicinity of the Harkins Theater, that, that part of Bricktown, which is not part of the Bricktown Design Review District. It's a separate PUD, and, which means it operates under its own rules. So we do have representatives uh, of the project here if you'd like to talk to them, but uh, that concludes my part of the presentation. I have a question for um, Commissioner Kovash. Uh, before we bring him up, um, could you talk about the sign part of it, please? The sign part? Yeah, um, because we, we've gone through the, the new rules on our murals and why, maybe also address why this is coming to us. So the, uh, these are considered, and the, um, the architects and the designers consider these two totally separate things. So the sign will be permitted under its own sign permit, and the murals would be permitted under a sign permit specifically for murals. So even though they coordinate, their, their, our interpretation is that they are two separate items. Gotcha. So we don't, this is staff interpretation. We do not see a conflict. I didn't think there was. I just wanted to make sure that it had been addressed. And um, is there a reason why this came to the commission after our rule change on the murals? They haven't gone into effect yet. Okay. So they, okay. we're about a month out before the, the new uh, ordinance goes into effect. And even then, I, I, just today I was talking with Laura Griggs, who's uh, in charge of some of the design review districts. And uh, she noted that even after the ordinance changes, will anything that was started before that will go ahead and be processed according to the old ordinance until, those are, until that one is entirely finished. <clears throat> Commissioner Cooper? Let me make sure that I'm understanding because my question is similar to Commissioner Kovash's. And that is on, on the, uh, and I'm looking at the uh, artist rendering. If you would go back, Robin. Slide. Yes. yes, thank you. That one. The uh, red and yellow and blue figures, I mean, to me, one of them looks sort of like a bird, but I don't know if it's really intended to be a bird on the, the one that folds around the corner of the building, the column, the big brick, appears to be a brick column. Right. And, and the painting is, uh, the mural is on two sides of that. Um, and then there's another element that is over on the other uh, wall to the right. Mm -hmm. Is that the part that we're looking at? Because I'm also looking at the round thing that I think that got, uh, Commissioner Kovash's attention, the, what appears to be a logo. So that's not part of this app. It's just, it's there, but right. it's not part of the application. It's just the exactly. other figures that are part of the application. Exactly. Okay. Only, only the non-objective design work is part of the application. And there are three, three areas. Uh, one on the brick facade that wraps around a corner. Yeah. And then you notice to the, uh, to the uh, lower left of that, Coming up from the ground plane, yes. there is a section there. And then to the upper left, there is a third section on, I think that's EFAS, uh, that surface. Okay. And this will be a combination of spray paint and acrylic exterior paint used on this. OK. It's just hard not to see the logo. Okay. Commissioner Loftus? I think I figured this out. Uh, I think this is an abstraction of Dave's hot chicken. 
and with parts of the chicken and other places <laughs> that have obviously been dedicated to the patrons in the restaurant. Is that right? Commissioner <laughs> Chambers, <laughs> do you have an item? <laughs> Uh, yes, and I'm thinking about the scope of what the commission considers. This next steps after our review, since it doesn't fall under Bricktown review, is it Urban um, um, URA, is that correct? What's the acronym? It goes to Acura, exactly. The okay. urban, so this was originally an Acura property, uh, and the PUD uh, was uh, the original agreement. The Okura was involved in that. So uh, honestly, I don't understand the full mechanism, but I do understand that it will go for uh, Okura for review. It appears to me that this is painted on brick. Um, will that be con a consideration for any of the further bodies? I guess we're, that's speculation. I can't it's really entirely say. possible that, uh, that Okura will address that and will make recommendations about that. And you may also make recommendations about that. And at this point, you know, we just remind ourselves that the Arts Commission is a recommending body yeah. and not a legislative, mm -hmm. but certainly uh, the commission is free and should make any kind of recommendation that it wants to. And if, I, if I'm missing a description, a visual description of the rendering of the artistic elements, it appears to me that it's a, a trompe l'oeil effect where the building is cracking and underneath is exposed um, non-representational, non-objective, some gestural color fields. Is that what we're seeing? Yes. Here ends my questions. I think that's a good segue to asking the artists if they would uh, like to speak on the piece. We have uh, representatives of the building ownership. Of building ownership. Hi, can you say your name and address for I'm the record? I'm Kelly Allen, 1707 Huntington, Nichols Hills. Thank you. I'm one of the partners with Dave, so I'm not one of the artists. I'm dressed like an artist today, <laughs> but uh, I'm, we're, we're actually the operators of, of this Dave's Hot Chicken and Fuzzy's Tacos next door. Um, what questions do you guys have? Commissioner Chambers. Is this part of your branding? Yes, it is. So the interior, so the idea of, of this is basically to lead into our interior branding, where these guys will also come in and wrap elements of Oklahoma City into our interior spray paint, maybe even some different uh, graffiti. We'll incorporate probably the thunder um, or a chicken slam dunking a basketball in there. It's so this specific. kind of all, the, the exterior all leads into what the interior will, uh, will reflect. For context, can you explain some of that? Um, how does the outside connect to the inside? So it, they'll, they'll take a lot of these color schemes and designs and incorporate them on the inside as well. Um, on the walls, on the ceilings, on the bathrooms, um, it, it all kind of ties in together. It doesn't all kind of tie, it does tie in together. Commissioner Thank Cooper. You. And we're, just so you guys know, we are working on the interior design as well to incorporate the proper elements of Oklahoma City on the interior, um, which I know this is not what we're discussing, but it is part of the, the design. Thank you. Mm, of course. <clears throat> I, I am recalling that it, I read the presentation rather quickly, mm -hmm. but I thought that it made a statement that in the various locations where Dave uh, puts their uh, restaurants, mm -hmm. that you do incorporate elements from each local community, but those are on the interior of the building and this is, this is, is this what, is this similar to, or the same as other Dave's locations in other parts on ours. the outside? No, this will be unique to just ours. Um, oh. And of course, not all cities allow this to happen. Um, we're hoping this city does, but uh, th this is unique just to our location here. Oh, okay. The logo, that's standard. So the, the two chicken heads, yes, standard. <laughs> and the uh, Dave's Hot Chicken in red, the signage is standard, yes. Okay. Commissioner Chambers. That brings me back to the artistic elements. You commissioned Splatter House. Splatter House, correct. Uniquely for this yo this location. We did. It's not part of branding on any other. So, so Dave's implores a couple of different uh, graffiti artists across the nation. Uh, this is the one that we liked the best out of all the ones that we sampled. 
Um, eventually, we would like to find a local artist to do our ongoing projects, but for this one, um, we really liked their presentation, honestly, and, and what they brought into the, uh, to the building and, and to the interior. And, and again, this will be unique. Even though you're using a, a pool of, of artists um, who work for other locations, other franchisees, this particular rendering will be unique. Very much so. Okay. Yes. We haven't mm. seen this on any other days that we've seen to this point. And in the future? In the future. It will remain unique. Correct. Commissioner Kovash. And this will be a new build, yes? No, this is an existing build. This okay. building's 2004. Um, where Sonic is, I believe. Sonic oh, it's the old Sonic yes. building. Okay, uh, so it's not, is next door. it's not historic, though, yeah? No. Okay. And it's a brick veneer. Um, we are developing a plan to remove um, that, uh, to have a process to remove it if we did vacate in the future. We're working with the building owners on that currently. And our architect is actually working on it now. Okay. Um, can you repeat that really quick? That might be interesting information. So we're working on a process to have this, if we did vacate the property at some point, to remove it if need, if need be um, it, on the brick. And that's a process that we're coming up with, with now. This is newer brick. It's not the old porous brick um, that's typically downtown in that Bricktown area. It's 2004, and so we are told that you are able to remove things like this if need be. It is reversible. We're working on that process, yes. Okay. Commissioner Cooper? There are a lot, there appears to be a lot of surface that uh, doesn't have anything on it. Is it contemplated that you may uh, expand the artistic expression on more of the surfaces of this so building? Our, yes, our, well, our original scope was to bring it down to below the awnings along the side and basically wrap around the building. Um, but honestly, after we reviewed that and we reviewed that with the building owners, it was a little too much. And so we toned it down greatly, honestly, to this. Sometimes less is more. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Are you going to close this side? Um, yes, we are. Mm -hmm. We're hoping this one is as well. I would like to move for approval. We have a motion for approval from Commissioner Seward. Is there a second? I'll second. And a motion from Commissioner Loftus we for a second. Um, um, art marker. Uh, okay. Strongly recommend that there are waivers signed by the artist. So that should be included in the motion. Could I speak to that for just a moment? Yes. So uh, there, we do have a VERA waiver, and so I wrote the agenda. Uh, I had Prior overlooked the VERA waiver, but it is, we already have that in the packet. Do we still need an art marker? Uh, there wasn't any uh, design for the art marker, but that is part of the recommendation, as it is it's standard for us to recommend an art marker. And that was in the application packet, and so we anticipate seeing that also. But it wouldn't hurt to restate that in whatever recommendation you make. And currently, we're supposed to highly recommend that you consider the long-term implications of painting on currently unpainted. And apparently, they have. We have. So <laughs> got that part out of the way. Um, I may have moved too quickly. Are there any other people here to speak on this item? Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Um, any further discussion? We are now in discussion portion of the motion. And would you want to edit your motion to include the staff recommendations? I Commissioner Seward, Commissioner Loftus. Oh, please. Because I think. Well, I don't know. Right? <laughs> Certainly, I will. Yes. Okay. This. <laughs> yes, I had not. Okay. Those items have been added to the motion. For further discussion, um, I. I think we should stress the importance of an art marker in this case. Um, to distinguish um, that this is not just a design project that is unrecognized and a part of the entire branding uh, of your business. The reason why it's before this body is, it because, is because it is a unique work of art by an artist or, or a team of artists. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I want to stress the importance of highlighting the creatives who've made this possible, and that it is a unique mm -hmm. artistic experience. Of course. And, and the artist will appreciate that as well. Okay, great, thank you. 
Hearing no further discussion, I think it's time for a roll call vote, Mark. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner Bailey? Yes. Commissioner Kovash? Yes. Commissioner Chambers? Yes. Commissioner Cooper? Yes. Commissioner Eichmann? Yes. Commissioner Loftus? Yes. Commissioner Mossant? Yes. Commissioner Seward? Yes. That completes the vote, Madam Chair. The motion passes. Thank you. Item 3C, discussion and possible action on revising selection procedures for public art projects. This applies to all wards. So unfortunately, uh, Commissioner Salyer was unable to be here today, but she was the impetus for this coming up right now. It's not that other people haven't brought it up before, but uh, just to recap what happened in the selection for the Civic Center project, uh, we were probably about four or five artists deep into however many it was, the 25 or so that had entered in the first round of selection. And uh, Commissioner Salyer said, hold on just a second. Do we really, really need to look at every one of these in great detail? And what particularly spurred this on was that uh, there were some entries, and we have these every single time, entries that uh, there is um, several euphemisms came to mind, but anyway, there's just no way that, that the artist could be chosen. Uh, I think a lot, I think not a lot, but a number of artists from time to time operate on the lightning could strike uh, theory, that it could, I could be chosen, you know, uh, homecoming queen out of um, all, all of the uh, girls in the school or something like that. It, it happens, but it, it, is, it is highly unlikely. Uh, so the question is then, and then also there, there are uh, artists that do not follow the rules. Now, most of the time, uh, if they haven't followed the rules of the RFQ, I'll eliminate those before they even go to the committee. If it's kind of marginal, I'll take it to the committee because I feel like that everybody needs a hearing. So that's generally the way that we've operated. And more specifically, the way we've operated is, and the way the RFQs have been written, is that every single entry that is, via, that is uh, follows the rules will be considered by the selection committee. So um, Commissioner Salyer asked if there was any way about, uh, around this. So we discussed right there in the meeting, uh, Rita and the committee uh, and I all discussed the possibility of making some changes. And we were able to make some within the constraints of the way the RFQ was written right then, but we're looking at a more substantial long-term structural change in the way the decision is being made. So the recommendation from staff um, is that we have a procedure, and I'll give you that procedure in a little bit, for uh, reducing the amount of, of entries, submissions that go to the selection committee to a manageable amount. We, are, we have selection committees that are primarily staffed by volunteers and they're, everybody is busy, we know this, everybody has multiple things that they need to be doing. And so this, we regard this as being respectful of the time that the volunteers are bringing to the committee. And so the recommendation is that a, basically a vetting committee that would be, con, that would consist of the public art professional that is on every, that is on every selection committee, the arts commissioner or commissioners that are on a selection committee, and then arts and cultural affairs staff meet as a committee to vet every single one. So still every single submission is going to be looked at and be given the consideration that it's due. But when we come to the, to the actual selection committees, there will be a recommendation from this group that I don't have a name for, the vetting group, uh, to consider this smaller number. We have a couple of projects that are going to come up within the next year where we're anticipating anywhere from 60 to 150 entries per uh, project. And not too long after I first came to the city, we had uh, the selection committee for Upper Scissor Tail Park. And that was an eight hour ordeal. And everybody <laughs> at the end of that day, it was kind of fun in its own way. But by the end of that period of time, people's eyes were totally glazing over. So we feel like that it is a responsible use of everybody's time uh, and energy 
to reduce this down to a number that the body can stand behind and say, let's give our attention to these. Now, one final thing. When I ran this idea past uh, planning director Jeff Butler, he said that he would like there to be some kind of mechanism that members of the committee could refer to the full body of all of the entries. I think that this is doable. Uh, and basically it would mean that we have those in some kind of accessible site that a committee member could go and look at those if they wanted to. So it's not like they're just cast off into the outer darkness never to be seen again. So there is the possibility that, select, that committee members could, could actually access those. And I wanted to see if Rita had any comments about this so far. Do you have anything to add? Not so far. Okay. Okay. So that's the general idea. And uh, you can discuss it and make a re recommendation today. You can discuss and recommend that we think about this some more and refine the details. So I'm going to leave that with you and take any questions that you have. And before we go further, I understand that there are, there's at least one commissioner and maybe more that need to go. Uh, so we may, that may take care of the discussion. It may be, con it may be continued because we lose quorum. So, Yes, Commissioner Cooper. <clears throat> uh, are there, d do you know from the discussions you had, are there, cons are the primary concerns that some of these uh, submissions just don't pass artistic muster, or you, they know that these people are not in a financial position to be able to produce the art that they are suggesting? I mean, are there some external criteria that can be used that are maybe a little bit less ambiguous than let's just cut the number down to a, a more manageable because th that doesn't tell me that we don't get very, really good, a large number of really uh, terrific uh, applications. And, as, and, and I guess I would assume that as our uh, public art becomes better and better known that we will get more applications from, from around the world we, we do get some international applicants uh, that we may get some really fabulous things from parts that people are just fine, we're finally reaching that kind of critical amount of attention where our, our public, and we have significant enough activity. But I mean, I see that as being different than someone who is making a proposal where you just know that they are in over their head. Uh, and, and, but it seems like you, could formulate some type of maybe a more external or objective criteria for the, I mean, I, people are supposed to evaluate whether or not they're in the, in the, in the uh, requests for submissions. They're supposed to do a little self-analyzing to see if they're qualified. Not all of them apparently do. Mm -hmm. uh, because I wouldn't want to arbitrarily exclude a lot of qualified artists from different venues uh, just to make it make the process itself more convenient. I personally agree 100 percent with everything that, that you've said with all of your concerns and yes there are those kinds of circumstances where you can look and see look at the what was submitted and I'm going to use Civic Center as an example here. So uh, we saw uh, there were a number of submissions for Civic Center where people were doing nice figurative bronze work, but that was all they did. There wasn't any indication of anything that was hanging, lighted, or had any of the other things that were called for. Nothing remotely similar to Art Deco. Does this mean that a bronze artist can't do that? No, but they haven't given us any any uh, kind of reason to really think more deeply about the work that they're doing. So that's one example. There's also examples of artists whose work tops out at the $2,500 level. And uh, one of them called me, and we, we do this kind of thing. We do technical assistance with artists that call us, and a lot of times they, they will call and they will want to know, why was I not selected, or can you give me some insight? 
if an artist has only worked at a level up to $2,500, there is no confidence that the selection committee can have that they're going to be able to translate their $2,500 work out of clay into $184,000 work of metal and glass or something that would be appropriate, and lighted on top of that, uh -huh. and with all of the engineering involved. So those are the kinds of things that would lead to the criteria that you're talking about, and I agree completely. The criteria need to be written out as specifically as possible without creating the Ten Commandments. There needs to be some room for interpretation. Um, so did, I'm not sure that I addressed every single yeah, I point just, that you had. I just wanted to express some current concern about arbitrarily cutting down and saying, well, we're just going to take the top five out of all these, and those are the only ones we're going to pay any attention to. Right. And I'm picking an extreme number. But uh, right. uh, and it, it seems that if, and I understand the premise, and I understand a lot of the submissions come in, you can tell this the work of this artist is not going to be able to do the job that we're looking at. Right. They're, they're, let, me, let me back up. That they haven't demonstrated the ability. That doesn't mean they don't have it, but they haven't demonstrated in their body of work the uh, breadth that would be necessary for a particular project. Right. However, if we get to, if, we consistently, if we start working on getting too many, which if, I remember when we were just hoping to get three or four. So, you know, it's, it's the downside of the upside, you, attention. Um, that if it's necessary, because there are just too many submissions, to have a screening meeting that goes through and, and, and does what you're talking about, rather than just having a committee of three people arbitrarily go through to, to, to make the process, I know it makes it longer, and every, I know you're always concerned about the amount of time that people can give, but uh, if it's not clear cut, maybe, maybe that's what the process needs, is a, a two-part consideration for those who go into the uh, more final consideration. And just to, uh, I hope, reassure everybody, we're not looking at a slash and burn type of operation. We want this to be a very thoughtful, uh, deliberative process that is done by the arts professional who's being paid for their time. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm staff and the arts commissioners are arts commissioners. So we feel like, that's why I feel like that, is, that would be the appropriate screening uh, committee. But and also those are people that would really uh, I feel like bring the kind of gravitas to the situation and make, make those kinds of distinctions that are valuable to the rest of the selection committee. And I think that also there's going to be some borderline cases that, um, you know, it probably is going to be better to bring a slightly larger number rather than following a strict rule that we're only going to take 20 percent or something like that. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Eichmann. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I totally understand, uh, but, and, but I think it's important that we're consistent across the board, which is that we publish that we have a two-step jury process that we use in every situation. We don't just isolate it to, gee, we have 50 as opposed to 25, and, you know, uh, artists or whatever. I think we have to be consistent with every arts project uh, in terms of that two-step vetting process. Um, I mean, you, I think you've got the right people there. The question I would have is... And, and maybe this is something Rita has to answer, does the artist, if they don't make it to the second step, have the, uh, do they have the opportunity, I'm not saying that they should, but to contest not making it to the second? Is there anywhere in this process where we would be, um, um, an artist could express dissatisfaction at the process and, and contest that? Boy, that's an ugly can of worms. Yeah. <laughs> If there was an irregularity of any sort, mm -hmm. then the artist could say, uh, I have a problem with this. But when the committee reviews, they are looking for artistic merit, which of course is subjective. And so a person could not say, uh, reasonably say, well, my art is beautiful, you should have chosen it. But if the cutoff is, you must submit your bid by X day at X time, and you don't, then that's a very objective factor to use to eliminate that submission. The rest of it, though, 
this committee that uh, Randy has described would filter through all of the applications that met the deadline and then they would screen them further, much in the same way that they are screened now. Does the person have an obvious ability to create the art that is, is wanted? Let's, let's say that the art in the Civic Centerpiece uh, that Randy's talking about, there was a brass submission. Well, if that's not clearly what the committee wanted, um, you could ask the artist, are you able to create that? But the information is indicated in the call. And so knowing that if the person submits something that's clearly outside the call, then it could indicate they don't have the ability to do that or follow instructions, one or the other. Commissioner Mossant. As someone who runs a business, I have always relied on hiring good people who will screen things for me and then I make the decision because I don't want to spend all that time. And then you talk about responding back to all of these people. In the real world, people apply, 100 people apply for a job. Four or five people are going to get the letter saying you were considered but not. But the companies do not respond to all 100 people. I, I'm, and I don't want to sit in a meeting that's eight hours of review. I want people that are good at it to give me five good choices. Uh, that's just my own opinion. Commissioner Kovach. Mm -hmm. This is what I used to do for, I'm oh, sorry. Yes, yes, this will be for information purposes. Only. I would like to s s go ahead and continue to speak for informational as soon as they're done. Is that, that's fine, oh, okay. right? We, Excuse me. No, so we can't continue to discuss oh, okay. since oh, we've sorry. lost quorum. So we'll, uh, we'll bring this up again next time. Okay, everybody make notes on your agenda for items that you'd like to discuss. Okay, thank you we very much. We need to make a motion. Oh, I guess we can't because once we've lost quorum, it automatically right. continues it to the next meeting, correct? Right. Okay. And uh, actually, the next meeting is very good for the, the selections that are coming up or after the next meeting. So it should, should there be a change, it will be good timing. Um, we can move on with the reporting portion of our agenda. Yes, there, there is nothing else that's going to be voted upon. Okay. So moving to item four, discussion action on reports from committees. Oh, I, I, I just thought we didn't have to. Okay. Well, bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs> adjourn. <laughs> So when a meeting, when it gets real close, I don't like the way it's going. If it's just like this, I pick up and walk out. And he's required a vote. Yes, really? Oh, I, I have been running Parley Pro wrong for a very long time. Because we, and all of our board meetings, if we don't have a quorum, it's like, there can be discussion, but there can be no vote. Not not on items that have a vote associated with them, but like. Thank you. An Is executive that director or board or something can still proceed. Meeting. Yeah, I know. Well, Reed is the expert, and I. Um, so the meeting, I the meeting something. is over. But remember that there is another one next <laughs> month. Just as a friendly reminder to those of you that happen to, be, and watch your emails.